Hello, my name is Sam. I am a software speech synthesizer for the Atari computer. I produce high quality speech from simple phonetic input. Or, I can translate English directly to speech. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Mark Barton was creator of SAM, Software Automatic Mouth. Released in 1982, SAM was the first software-only speech synthesizer for personal computers. It was available for the Apple II, Commodore 64, and Atari 8-bit computers. He later developed Macintosh, speech synthesis for the Macintosh computer, and Narrator, the speech system for the Commodore Amiga. This interview took place on May 22, 2020. Believe it or not, this all started with the album Switched on Bach. Sure. If, by Wendy Carlos. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm a classically trained piano player. I've um, been playing piano since four and a half. And um, when I heard that album, that just put the hook in me for electronic music. And uh, I've always, always been interested in electronics since I was about seven. And um, so electronics and music have always gone together uh, for me my, my whole life. Um, and, uh, I built my first modular analog synthesizer, um, in 1973, and I used it in a band. Uh, we had an, uh, Emerson Lincoln Palmer cover band. I was Keith. <laughs> and, um, uh, we're still, we're trying to put that band back together. <laughs> it's been 40 years and nobody's dead. So we're trying to put it back together to see what'll happen. Nice. But anyway, that's, that's, uh. That's beside the point. Um, And um, then in junior high school, there was a series of kits put out by uh, Bell Telephone. And one of them was called Speech Synthesis. And believe it or not, uh, you built a vowel synthesizer from scratch with the parts that were supplied. And you built it on the cardboard box that the thing came in. And it was all discrete, discrete transistors. And you would put different value capacitors in and press the key and it would go, ah, and you change the three capacitors and you press the key and it went E. And so, and then it came with a record and that record had uh, the record, that famous recording of Daisy on it. And that was that, that just, that put the hook in me, my, the hairs on my back stood up. I went, this is something that I have to know about. So, um, Years later, um, okay, so that was in that was in junior high school. So that was 1968 when when that speech synthesis thing came out, and then Switched on Bach came out. I got interested in synthesizers, built the synthesizer in '73, and then um, uh, when I got an Apple II, I decided. And one of the main reasons to get the Apple II was to use it to control an analog speech synthesizer. So mm-hmm. I already knew how to build. You know, voltage control oscillators, voltage control filters, amplifiers, all of the necessary parts that you would build a, a format speech synthesizer out of, I, I already had designs for and I knew how to make. So uh, I designed some circuit boards and I put together a, uh, an analog, all analog uh, speech synthesizer um, that was controlled by the Apple II. And I wrote, wrote a program in BASIC to control it. Uh, my only regret is I have no recordings of it. I wish I, yeah, I don't re- remember how it sounded, but, um, hmm. that, uh, it, uh, it was, it was successful. It, it did work. And so then I kind of looked at it and I looked at the waveforms things were producing and I was wondering, well, gee, I've got all this hardware, all these boards and everything hanging off this computer. Is there a way that I can make this all happen with the CPU by itself. I mean, it was a crazy goal given the amount of power that the CPU had, you know, you're you're talking, you know, eight bits, one megahertz, um, you know, no Ram available to, you know, speak of, you know, what, 48 K Ram. And so I just, I decided to take this to the ultimate, what's called terminal analog, uh, uh, goal. Uh, when you model something using a uh, terminal analog technique, what you're doing 
is you're modeling, you're creating an analog to the terminus of the thing. In other words, you're modeling the output. You could care less how you got there. You're not trying to imitate the system that is producing the output. You're just trying to imitate the output because mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what you hear. So I, I broke things down to, you know, the, the, the most basic, basic, you know, uh, replacing the uh, filters with, uh, with syncable function generate. I, you know, I did all kinds of crazy things to, to try to eliminate uh, as much as possible and get this to run in real time, uh, you know, on that, on that computer. And of course it was all written in 65 and two assembler and it worked and amazingly enough. Um, and it, it was intelligible. It had a, you know, the voice was very, very buzzy, but it was readily understandable. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, and it, and it was a su successful piece of software. It, it sold, uh, on all the platforms. It was available on, uh, the Apple II at first, and then, uh, the Atari, of course, and the, uh, the Commodore 64. Uh, and we sold over 50,000 copies, which was, which was huge for the time, you know, not everybody owned a computer. You know? right. and, uh, so it was, it was a, a success. And that's pretty much the story of how I got to Sam. Hmm. Um, the, and so it came through via electronic music. Um, and a speech synthesizer is just a very specific kind of music generator. It uses, you know, the same, the same uh, parts, uh, you know, oscillator, noise source, filters, amplifiers. And you just have to make them all dance right and the thing talks. So that's uh, uh, that's pretty much it. Nice. Um, up to, up to that point. Sure, I'm amazed that you started. You got Sam working first on probably as from from just a sound perspective, the most difficult computer of the three. I mean, you know, Atari had pretty decent sound, and and the Atari and the Commodore 64 had good sound. But I mean, the, the Apple. I mean. It, it was lucky to beep, you know, and yet you had it talking. Right, right. The Apple, okay, um, was the only version that came with a board. We actually manufactured a little circuit board mm -hmm. that had an 8-bit digital analog uh, converter and an audio amplifier on it so that it, it did actually output superior sound to the other two computers. Um, all of the sound was computed by the CPU. There was, a, we used none of the capabilities of the sound chips on the other two computers. So they were completely useless uh, to the task. Uh, we did, I did look at it thoroughly to see if I could take advantage of anything that was on those chips. And uh, there was nothing of any use. So uh, they were just used as a straight DAC, you know, just to get audio out. Um, so I guess ironically, the Apple sounded best of the three. <laughs> so it sounds like you went into the, I, I learned about speech synthesis from uh, my pirated copy of Sam um, and mm -hmm. the about you know what a phoneme is and how to put uh, words together and and you know it had the uh, somewhere I got a copy of the, the manual where you could type you know slash h e h three l o w and you know how to make yeah, make it right. make it talk in that way and um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you came to this this whole project already knowing quite a lot about that because of your research with kits and things? Well, um, actually, it, it, there was, uh, uh, I, I read tons of papers. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. went through tons and tons of books and uh, did a, a lot of research. I, I really enjoy that aspect of a project. Um, so I read books and, and endless papers on acoustic phonetics and, and synthesis by rule. And um, also used uh, the uh, used a, a project called MyTalk, which was the text-to-speech system developed by uh, MIT in I think 1979, and they published a book uh, called the MyTalk Project. I think that's what it was called, and it outlined a lot of the rules that they used. They did publish a lot of their results, and um, pretty much the block diagram of the system where you take, you know, you start with the English and then, you know, you have to translate it to phonemes. And then they did um, part, part of speech analysis. They actually did broke down the sentences as the, you know, subject and predicate, and this is the sentence structure and all that. 
to get the timing and prosody and pitch contours, uh, you know, to be as, as natural as possible. We didn't do any of that. Uh, we just looked at, um, uh, well, this is actually in later, not in Sam, but in later versions, um, looked at whether or not a word was a content word or a function word. Function words are things like the, of, and, but, you know, those little words like that that connect things. And content words actually have content, you know, like sky, swimming pool, you know, run, you know, sure. things like that, nouns and verbs. And so we knew, the, uh, so content words get more stress than, I'm, yes, than function words. And, and we would build the, the sentence prosody that way. Uh, the timing and pitch contours um, were, were built from very simple, uh, simple data. We, did, we didn't uh, go into the really in-depth um, uh, you know, first of all, there was uh, in the early manifestations of these things, there was just no memory, <laughs> you know, and uh, a lot of times, the you know, doing all of that would have been uh, pretty slow as well. Sure. So, um, so we just used punctuation, you know, uh, comma and dash and period and question mark were all recognized. Uh, the dash would just put a simple pause in, the comma would put a pause with a rising inflection. Uh, at the end of the pause and uh, question mark, the you know the pitch would go up at the end. Period. Pitch would go down. Um, a lot of people, when they demo the programs, they don't put the punctuation in, and it sounds terrible. You got to put a period at the end <laughs> of, of, of everything to make it sound right. Otherwise, it just kind of stops. You know, right. it, uh, uh, the last syllable of sentences uh, is about forty percent longer than it would normally be if it was not at the end of the sentence and also the pitch falls quite a bit at the end. So there's all these rules. So you've got pitch rules and timing rules, letter to sound rules, phonological rules. An example of that would be like uh, the word Atlantic. We don't say Atlantic. We don't, you know, we say at and then there's a glottal stop and then the Atlantic, you know, we say it like that. So it looks at various combinations like it sees a T and an L like that. It, it it substitutes a glottal stop for the T and, you know, makes these substitutions and insertions of, of, of phonetic segments um, to follow these pronunciation rules. And then there's a whole, then there's another segment that a section that does uh, the timing rules for every segment and uh, another section that does the pitch contour, assigns pitch targets to every syllable. And then it, it, so it just gets broken down finer and finer. Finally, you're at the segmental level of the phonemes and then, and then each phoneme has acoustic targets and then that builds up a, an array of acoustic targets and then those are smoothed from one phoneme into the next. And finally, you have the synthesis kernel that reads this array of coefficients that you've generated and, and produces the speech. So it's a whole big multi-level affair. And uh, we use the MyTalk project as inspiration for that, you know, we, we, of course we couldn't copy it, but we did use it as a guide. And um, pretty much all the speech synthesizers that came after that all were based on my talk. Deck Talk was based on my talk. The Pros 2000 that Stephen Hawking used was based on my talk. Um, so that was really a a big uh, a big source of um, of uh, information and a, a great springboard to uh, for all these systems. Hmm. Were there any any unexpected uh, challenges that you you came happened when you were creating it? I mean, I don't know, maybe certain uh, particular sound that was super difficult to to make or. Uh, um. Okay. Well, it depends which version you talk. Are we talking about Sam mostly here? Yeah, just uh, Sam at this point. Yeah. Okay, Sam at this point. Sam was going to sound like whatever Sam sounded like because there was <laughs> just no choice. There were no CPU cycles left. Either this was going to work or it wasn't, and. Uh, so, you know, I've got, I've got a good ear. A lot of these, a lot of the things I've done, and I, I think that the, uh, the results are good because of just fine tuning, just a lot of listening and tuning and, uh, you know, fixing stuff up. It's, it, it's, it's kind of funny when a speech synthesizer sounds just okay, people will forgive it. They'll forgive pronunciation errors. They'll forgive that it sounds like a computer. Mm -hmm. They'll forgive everything. Mm -hmm. But once it starts sounding good, even tiny little things get bothersome. So it's, it's very funny. If, you know, the, like the more you get right, the more you have to get right. 
because people are not forgiving once it starts sounding good. Huh. Um, and uh, so Sam was just, you know, he sounded like he had a buzzsaw in his throat. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> just because of the just because of the nature of the algorithm, there was just no time to do it better. Sure. And uh, <laughs> you know, that's how it came out. On the, I don't know if you remember this on, on the Atari version. By default, it would blank the screen while it talked because it gave yeah. it, it it gave it about fifteen percent more processing power. Um, and you, and if you cheated and didn't blank the screen, it really sounded bad real fast. <laughs> it went from. I, I believe that was because you couldn't deliver the samples at a constant sampling rate into. Uh, we, the DAC in the Atari uh, was actually the Atari output is four bits, and it's the four bits of volume control. So actually, we're putting DC into the volume control and moving the volume control up and down, mm -hmm. you know, with the with the audio. So that was a way to to force the chip in the Atari to be a DAC, you know, a digital analog converter. Right, so, just like uh, popping the speaker manually, basically. I think, right? Right. Yeah. And uh that was the only way to to do it. And um and I believe it's also mapped in a strange way because it's not linear. They're in like a DB steps. And so we needed to have a like a linear log mapping and then drive the volume control and, and you know so it, it does sound a little grainy on the on the Atari for that reason. It sounded great. I'm not complaining. It was it was wonderful. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> how so? How did you get it published? I'm I'm unclear if if you were Don't Ask Software or if you licensed it to them or or how. Tell me how that worked. Well, okay. So the way it worked was Don't Ask Software were two friends of mine from high school. Um, by the name of Randy Simon and Rachel Cohen, married couple. And uh, they formed Don't Ask Software. And people love the name because you walk up to them and it, it is the answer to why did you go into the software business? <laughs> and that is that is the, the name of the company. Um, so they had a couple of programs that were already on the Atari and one was called abuse mm -hmm. and it would modify the operating system to constantly throw insults and horrible things at you the entire time you're using your computer and uh randy has fantastic uh, he's in a, just an amazing sense of humor so it was a very funny program and it would just throw, throw all of these horrible insults at you and change the system messages to something to, to these horrible messages so that was abuse then they had another program called um, Word Race, which was a, a word game, which is very, very good. And they had me port both of these over to the Apple II. And that was my beginning with Don't Ask. And um, I did that, I think, before I even wrote Sam. And then I wrote Sam and I approached them with it and they loved it and um, hired a guy to design, you know, the, the character of Sam for the cover, you know, that talking diskette. Mm -hmm. uh, that's on the box and uh, and on the manual and um and i i just i was on a just on a royalty basis with them and so, they're the it, ones that sold the, the fifty thousand copies all right so you did okay with it financially i hope did yeah well i didn't uh didn't expect to uh you, you know this is back in the days when you you bought a bought a piece of software for 50 bucks even if it was nothing you know and I think the Apple one, because I had a board and it had to be a little bit more expensive, I think it was $49. And it sold really well. Uh, the Atari, I think, sold second best, and the Commodore 64 sold the most, as I recall. But they were all real good. They are all real good. Cool. Um, yeah. And it seems like later a version was published by a company called Tronix. I think Tronix bought the titles from Donat. Oh, okay. Sure. And yeah, to continue publishing them, because uh, yeah, they both Randy and uh, say Randy and Rachel, they they were partnered with another couple, and um, they had real professional careers. I mean, Randy's got a PhD in cryogenic science, and Rachel teaches philosophy at the at, uh, University of Albany now. You know, so two very very smart people, and. Uh, 
they moved on from uh, publishing silly software. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in some of my research, I found the name Joseph Katz associated with. Yeah. Um, tell me. That's right. Tell me. He, who it was. He is another friend from high school. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I'll, I'll leave this high school stuff is when I was in the 11th grade, I discovered a room in our high school. This is at Hamilton High School in West Los Angeles. There was an IBM 1130 in there. Mm. This was the only computer in the Los Angeles City Schools for, that students could use. It was the first and only. And um, they were teaching classes, but it got most of most use by us after school. We would take a punched card and fold it and tape it to the lock of the door so that it wouldn't lock. <laughs> and uh, so when people left, you know, nine o'clock at night, here's 10 guys in the in the room. Um, you know, messing with this, messing with this computer, learning Fortran. And um, there was one key punch and uh, the IBM 1130, the card reader, the CPU, the disk drive with an enormous platter disk that held a, an amazing one megabyte and, uh, and a printer. Um, so that, that was the machine I learned to program on. I've, I, I've never, I, I went to UCLA um, and I actually went to college for three, for three years. It was a complete waste of time. I wasn't learning anything, and uh, I started working. But uh, actually, at UCLA, I was an internet pioneer on the ARPANET wow. in, uh, 19, in 1973. I uh, worked for Leonard Kleinrock, and I actually know the guy very well that sent the very first message on the internet. Um, so I was there. I was doing... Uh, doing um, diagnostics on the net, it had uh, 20 sites. The entire net was 20 sites. Mm -hmm. And um, I would generate empty packets, empty messages, and trace how they went around the net and back to UCLA and record how the packets came back in what, whatever order and generate reports. You were doing manual trace route, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, uh, who remembers how I did any of this really a long <laughs> right. time ago? And of course, the net doesn't work that way anymore. But yeah. um, uh, the room I work in is now a museum. They put a plaque on the wall. They try to get as much original equipment back in there as they could. And the plaque reads, in this room is generally believed to be the first instance of the internet, you know, where the internet began, you know. And uh, so I worked there for a year. And, um, and I had learned to program in high school. I didn't, I, you know, on this. And because they were doing all of this stuff in Fortran, and I already knew Fortran, so boom, I'm employed on the on the internet. Nice. And um, so that was that was fun. So I like to I like to say I was the first spammer because <laughs> I would generate all of these empty packets, and it would actually the net was you know not lightning fast back then, and it would actually clog the entire network to the point where I would get an email. Yes, I had email. We all had email back in 73 and um, uh, asking me, could you please do your experiments in the middle of the night? Because, you know, I, I destroyed the entire Internet. <laughs> I, 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 took, I would take it down every day. So I would have to return to UCLA around two in the morning and uh, run my experiments then. Nice. When nobody else was, when no one else was using the Internet. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny to think about right now. Yes, no one's on the internet it's now. You, you do your work. Yeah. <laughs> you had all the bandwidth in the world, literally. Yeah, yourself. you're right. At 300, at 300 bucks. Right. <laughs> mm. um, all right, so what is next in the SAM story? Uh, you, you, so next? You know, I mean, it was being published for, the, for those, those little microcomputers, and then what happened? So then the big, the big thing happened. Steve Jobs calls. And he contacted Don't Ask, and um, then it was arranged. You know, he wanted he wanted a text-to-speech system in the yet unreleased Macintosh. So this was like almost I don't want to say it's two years before the Mac was released. So the Mac was released in '84. Right. I don't know if he contacted us in 82 or 83, but it was right around there. It was a, a, almost a year or at least a year before 
the Mac was launched and it was still secret what it was. People knew the name Macintosh, but they had no idea what it was. So uh, in talking to them, I realized that I would, you know, there would be a lot of systems integration to do. Um, we're moving up in a big way from a one megahertz, eight bit machine to a, to an eight megahertz, 16 bit machine, you know, 68,000, you know, uh, writing assembly language on the 68,000 is compared to the 6502. It's like driving a Volkswagen Beetle compared to a, a Lincoln Continental limousine. I mean, to me, there was such a huge difference. It was so much easier to, uh, to write, uh, for the 68,000. But um, so we knew this was going to be an entire rewrite. And so I asked my friend, uh, Joe Katz, who is a great programmer, also learned on that 1130 back at, uh, uh, back at Hamilton High School, if he wanted to partner up. And he would, he would work on the synthesizer too, but mostly his responsibility would be systems integration, API, all the stuff that I think at, you know, was uh, um, uh, he took care of. And um, so we worked on it together and Apple flew us up there. And I remember meeting with Steve Jobs and I remember vividly the meeting. We went into a little office and he kind of had his back halfway to us and he was adjust adjusting the vertical blinds, you know, twisting the rod. And he would glance over his shoulder back at us and he said, I'm not gonna pay you a million dollars. That, that was like the first thing out of it, but he did pay us an awful lot of money. The Apple was just giving away money at the time. I think the guy made it, the, the guy that wrote Mac Paint, he did pay him a million dollars for that. Um, so to give you an idea, we both bought houses in West LA with the, with the money from it. Excellent. Uh, so that was, uh, that was really nice. I remember doing a big dance in the parking lot after that. <laughs> Um, so then later on, uh, we went back up there and we were, we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement to look at the Mac prototype. This was the thickest non-disclosure agreement I have ever seen in my life. It was like a dictionary. I mean, it was thick. Um, non-disclosure agreements are usually one to two pages. This had to be 60 pages long. And of hmm. course, who could read that sitting there? Sure. So we signed it. And then I think it was Guy Kawasaki, you know, that name from Apple. Sure. Chief of he, he was our liaison. Yeah. So it was Guy Kawasaki reaches under the counter and he pulls out that lunchbox Mac with a nine inch black and white screen. And we just sank. We both looked at it and went, oh, really? And then he turned it on and it was black and white. And we went, really? Where are the slots? Oh, there are no slots. We were both very, very disappointed when we when we first saw that Mac, and um, you know it turned out not to be the greatest machine in the world. Yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> um, and it was very, it was you know, you had to load the operating system every time, you know, off a of floppy, and and there was no room on a disk to store anything, and it was anyway, it was it was not great. It was not great, and and I actually told him, I go, well, okay, you know what people are expecting. They're expecting a 68,000 machine with slots and color. <laughs> you know, that's what people are expecting. <laughs> but I guess they didn't get the memo. Um, and, um, and so we, uh, we they, they gave us a Lisa to do development on. Talk about and a bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, right. They get, well, they didn't have any Macs sure, you know, to sure. do development. You, you couldn't develop on a Mac. So they gave us a Lisa with the external hard drive thing and actually joe kept that and i did my development on a very strange computer that i bet nobody has ever heard of it was the mtu 130 mtu was a company uh owned by hal chamberlain and he's uh, very much an electronic audio guy electronic music uh guy and um the mtu 130 mtu stood for microtechnology unlimited and this computer had two CPUs in it. It was actually the, the main computer was a 6809 processor and that ran everything that okay. ran the screen. All the compilers were written in, you know, for the 6809, but it had a 68,000 board in it. 
and uh, that board was connected to uh, a port that you could plug a DAC into. And it, uh, this, it, so it had a 6809 to 68,000 cross compiler. So I wrote the synthesizer on that because um, you know the audio worked easily and everything. I didn't have to worry about audio drivers and I, I could get the synthesizer up and running uh, on that. And it was a great little machine. It really was. Um, I don't have that machine anymore. I do have my original Apple II that I did Sam on. I still have that. Nice. And I think we still have the Lisa. They actually wanted it back, but we never gave it back. <laughs> do you still have the, your your original? You don't have your original custom board for your first generation of the speech thing for the uh, for the Apple. Oh, that the analog. Yeah. The uh, analog thing? Yeah, I do in a box somewhere. I have all the boards. Cool. Well, you said you never heard, you never had a recording of it talking. So I mean, it's not too late. Oh boy, I, I yeah, I don't think I'm going to be resurrected. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the software would be that that runs it or whatever. But so for I could, uh, these days, I could write a simulation of it, no problem. Sure. Um. So how much of of Macintosh was porting, and how much was complete rewrite from Sam? Complete rewrite. 100% complete rewrite, yeah. ground up, yeah. There was no point in salvaging anything. I mean, we had we had a much better better processor and uh, and more speed, so the model could get better. Um, it's in the spirit of SAM in that there are no real filters. Uh, the formats are not real filters. They are what's called um, FOF filters. I think that, uh, that stands for... Um, uh, Format oscillator, or what does it stand for? Format oscillator function, or something like that. FOF. Anyway, I invented this technique, and the year I invented it, somebody published a paper <laughs> <laughs> outlining the exact same thing. Hmm. Some guy in France, uh, it, you know, uh, I mean, exactly the same thing. But I think I predate him a little bit with Sam. But um, so it's a way of modeling the output of a pulsed filter without having the software necessary, you know, or the, you know, the CPU overhead necessary to uh, actually run a real filter. There is, a, I think I sent you a link to the Mac unveiling with the, with the speech in it. You, mm -hmm. you saw, did you watch it? Yes, I did. Uh, you said you were in the audience for that unveiling. I don't want to know, I want to know about the unveiling of the, the Macintosh when, when you were there. Okay. Well, it happened at De Anza University. They used their auditorium for the, uh, and we had been at Apple, Joe and I had been at Apple for, at Apple for probably a week, um, getting that demo together. Uh, have you seen the speech, jo uh, the Steve Jobs movie where they argue about the speech demo? No, I don't think I've seen that. Okay, well, it's, it's not the one with Ashton Kutcher. It's the, it's the other Steve Jobs movie. Okay. And there's this whole argument where Steve Jobs is yelling, I want the speech to work. And Andy in and the Andy Hertzfeld character says, well, it's not gonna, we don't have this. Complete fiction, a hundred percent fiction. I didn't even know about this movie till somebody told me about it. And then I, I, I watched it and I went, Oh my God, this is about me. And it's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Screen says it's an unimplemented trap, but the air code is wrong. It's a system error. So what's the upshot? It's not going to say hello. It absolutely is going to say hello. It's nobody's fault. It's you a system built error. the voice demo. The voice demo Can is flaky. I've been telling down. you that for this thing is overbuilt. It worked last night. It worked the night before that. It worked three hours it's ago. Not working now. So just skip over the voice demo. Fuck you. Skip over Shh. everything else is working. Skip over the voice demo. We need it to say hello. You're not hearing me. It's not going to say hello. Fix it. Is the synthesizer sampling fast enough? No, so the rates are off, and it keeps crashing. It's 20 seconds out of a two-hour watch. Why not just cut it? We can't cut it. Part of the problem is what? we can recompile, but the hardware, if it's a hardware problem, we can't get into the back. Why not? Do you want to tell her, or should I? Don't start with me, man. Why can't he get into the machine? You need special tools. What kind of special tools? Just take a screwdriver. You didn't want users to be able to open it. You need special tools. So... There was never a problem with the speech working. It worked perfectly. The problem with the the launch was, you know, getting the demo is they had a lot of graphics. They had a bunch of scrolling graphics and demos, and they wanted it all to run seamlessly as one continuous demo, and it wouldn't fit. 
in a 120k 128k Mac. So they had a uh, you know what became known as the Fat Mac with uh, 512k, and they used one of those, even though it wasn't available, wasn't going to be available for a while. Uh, they used that for the de- for the de- the onstage demo. That was the big controversy, hmm. and so the the um, uh, the author of the movie claims, you know, even when challenged on this, that no, oh, this is absolutely the way it happened. I'm here to tell you, I was there. That's not the way it happens at all. So anyway, so we were at Apple for uh, about a week, and uh, somebody authored that piece of text that uh, the Mac says when Steve takes it out of the, you know, it sure is great to get out of that bag. That's become a famous, you know, sentence right. from the launch. And um, so they, they wrote that, and I coded it in, in phonetics. I didn't go in through the English, you know, entry point in the program. I, 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 I wrote that all out phonetically to get it all perfect. And I also said, you know what? It's a big auditorium. This is a new speech synthesizer. People are not used to it. Let's put this, the, you know, there were people were wondering, well, it, are people going to understand it? And I go, well, they're going to understand it with the words put up on the screen. <laughs> and so that's why the words are up there, because I said, people have no problem understanding what's being said if they're reading it at the same time. Right. <laughs> and, and, that, and that worked perfectly, because, you know, the reactions were great. And, uh, you know, huge thunderous applause to, uh, you know, after a talk and, you know, Jobs couldn't wipe the grin off his face. And he was he was really pleased. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. From a custom as I am to public meeting, I'd like to share with you a match and I thought of the first time I met an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer you can't with. Obviously, I can talk, but right now, I'd like to sit back and listen. So it is with considerable pride that I introduce a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. And we were all very, very happy that it ran. When it was about, when before the launch, you know, everybody was working and getting it all together, and, and everybody from Apple walked to the university, which is just down the road. And... Uh, Got everything set up. Uh, I was sitting in the audience. I remember in the upper left-hand side, near the top, near the back, um, with Joe, and um, met, met Steve Wozniak. And um, Steve Wozniak had a great saying. I don't know if he had just made it up on the spot when I was talking to him, but I, I had him autograph some stuff. And he said, "You know, we have reached the day where it used to be." that it would take you 15 minutes to type a letter, but now you can spend an hour and a half and get it perfect. And it wasn't until we put, we did another complete rewrite over to um, the IBM PC that we started using real filters. That the, the CPU was fast enough. Mm-hmm. And um, that was known. And we incorporated, we had a, pro, uh, Joe and I had a company called Soft Voice for about 15 years. And we licensed uh, the text-to-speech system uh, to various companies. Uh, Hewlett Packard uh, licensed it. Microsoft licensed it. A bunch of other companies, and um, uh, we, and we did a Spanish version. Um, and we were starting to do a German version. And then when they started putting a, a text-to-speech system into windows as a standard thing for free that you know that was that it you know we were done yeah hmm. the the uh the soft the i'm oh, sorry the soft voice text to speech.com website is still up but it, it looks is. like it hasn't been updated in a long time and i i, I guess maybe joe runs it because nobody responds to those email addresses no, nobody <laughs> does uh i believe he kept that open and he kept the soft voice um, corporation alive for medical insurance purposes. <laughs> you know? and, that, mm-hmm. and that was, uh, you know, it was economical to do. And, and I, I wrote that website in Notepad, in HTML, <laughs> nice. back, back, way, way, way back when. And it, yeah. the only thing interesting on it is there's some audio demos of, uh, 
you know, the diff- of a few of the different voices. You, you can still hear right. what, you know, what it sounded like. Um, a few years ago, and I, I really don't know if this was recently or, or 20 years ago, but somebody reverse engineered Sam, yes. figured out how it worked, and then ported it to C. Yes. And uh, there's a, ver- a couple versions of that online. And, I mean, it sounds exactly, exactly yeah. like Sam. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's pretty exact. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I've heard that. I don't know if that's been done with Macintosh also. So Macintosh also, the exact same software, um, we asked Steve Jobs, do you want an exclusive? And he said, no, didn't care if we licensed it, it licensed it to others. So that was great because right then the Amiga computer came into existence and they wanted the same thing. So, um, so Macintosh on the Mac is narrator on the Amiga. It's, it's pretty much the exact same software. Cool. Good for you. You pulled the Bill Gates on that and uh, <laughs> yeah, licensed that it. Same good. thing. And, to... and, and we actually collected a royalty per Amiga sold. So that was a nice ongoing web, revenue stream for a while until they, complete, until they completely screwed up their entire – the marketing on that computer was idiotic from day one. And everybody that worked on the computer said – the same worked on the Amiga said the same thing. I mean, you know, marketing always for some reason doesn't get it. You know, they, they didn't really show it off and in, in, they didn't explain it. They didn't show it off in commercials and ads properly. And I think if they had, they would have sold a lot more and it, you know, really would have been a leader uh, rather than just a, you know, it was more than a curiosity, especially the video toaster you know, mm-hmm. uh, gave the Amiga a lot of appeal, but, um, it was really the best machine of its type. You know, I mean, it had full multitasking color, you know, it was a Macintosh killer, but mm-hmm. it, it, you know, because of marketing, it didn't turn out that way. You're preaching to the choir here. I, <laughs> oh, okay. <you> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Amiga was made by basically the, the same team that created the Atari 800. Uh, so. Okay. It, oh, it's my, kind my of the minor the, and those guys. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, J minor. J minor. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, yeah, and uh, so it's really the the spiritual successor. Mm-hmm. So it was a great, great machine. Yeah, that deserved to uh, do better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we spent a lot of time at Amiga, um, integrating it into the OS. Uh, we were there for weeks and weeks. So got to know everybody on that team really well. Nice. Um, all right, so you said it kind of faded away once speech was available in, in Windows and, and yeah, well, uh, yeah once else. speech became a commodity, you know, licensing, people didn't need to license a special purpose, you know, um, system on a royalty basis right. anymore. They just weren't weren't really interested. And, and uh, to tell you the truth, I was burned out on it. I mean, we were doing this for 15 years, and uh, generally I don't last more than two years at anything, so... Um, that was, you know, it was good. You know, it, uh, you know, we competed with a lot of big boys and, and, uh, uh, prevailed a lot of the time, you know, like Microsoft chose us over Bell Labs and, you know, and, and learn out and house be and, and these other, these other companies. So I felt pretty good about that. You know, we were a two guy outfit, um, you know, going up against these, these, uh, big teams. Yeah. So now that speech is literally built into everything, I mean, mm-hmm. your computer, your phone, your Alexa, anything right. can talk. Do, do you do you have opinions about the state of speech synthesis now? Oh, it's amazing now. It's, you know, there's there are some uh, text-to-speech systems out there that you would have to listen to for quite a while to even think that it was a computer. You know, there's, there, especially with the, using uh, deep learning and deep neural nets, you know, to learn how to talk from... Uh, it picks up a tremendous amount of human quality, human natural quality. So, um, oh yeah, the state of the art has has moved tremendously from uh, when I was working with it. So, uh, tell me about what you do today. What I do today? Well, um, I am having a great time authoring electronic music modules for something called Voltage Modular. I don't know if you've seen this yet. It's uh, by a new company been around for about a year and something called cherry audio mm-hmm. and um it's a team of people who have been in 
music software for quite a while and they got together and formed this company and uh, they came out with a modular synthesizer platform called Voltage Modular and they came out with a uh, design uh, tool that makes it easy to author your own modules and a store in which to publish your modules and sell them and it's I've done about 19 modules so far I've got maybe 20 more in the works right now and it's just been it's been like a whole new life you know <laughs> going back to uh to electronic uh electronic music design um hmm. i did have a whole i uh i have also designed a bunch of electronic music modules that are out on the market i, I designed something called the Zeroscillator, which won uh editor's choice award for best analog synthesizer back in 2007 five 2005 something like that and I just uh, and it's an analog piece and it's all analog electronics and I just ported it over to voltage modular and um, the zero oscillator was very expensive uh, it was very popular but very expensive the cheapest one I think it was 750 bucks it ranged all the way from 750 almost up to two thousand dollars a piece for this one oscillator and um, People, people loved it so much that they, they paid it, they paid that price, and they, and they, um, uh, you know, we couldn't make enough of them. Um, but I just ported it over to Voltage Modular, so now it exists in software. It sounds the same, and instead of fifteen hundred dollars, it's twenty five dollars. Plus, you can have as many of them as you want, and just keep dragging them onto the screen. <laughs> and um, it's, anyway, this platform is marvelous, and I'm having a great time. Uh, uh, creating uh, modules, I, you know, I used to have to, you'd have to design it, you'd have to find the parts, you'd have to source the parts, you'd have to lay out a circuit board, you'd have to, uh, you know, put your parts list together, get the thing manufacturable, design the graphics, get the metal punched, you know, do the silk screen, you know what I mean? I mean, to do a physical product. And now you can just type a module, type a module into, in, into existence. I mean, literally, I've done modules from my imagination to finished in an evening. So it's it's uh, it's it's a different, it's a completely different world uh, in uh, in uh, modular synthesizers now. Amazing! It's a lot of fun. So what haven't I asked you about the Sam time that I should have? Sam was a big deal. I was going to you know tell you actually why Sam is a big deal. Sam was a big deal because it was the first text to speech system that ran standalone on a microcomputer. That, that, was, that was absolutely a first. And, um, you know, it might not have sounded amazing, but, you know, there it was. <laughs> pretty, pretty proud of it. Um, it kind of proves that your ear is very forgiving. <laughs> of all, as long as you put the essential cues out there, your, your ear will make speech out of it. Um, oh, okay, there's, here's something else. Um, uh, there was a professor at UCLA in the uh, phonetics department. His name was Peter Latifoge, he, and he's, a, he's an Englishman and um, a very prominent researcher in the field of acoustic phonetics. I mean, if you read old articles on speech, his name is like on everything. Um, and I never took any classes from him. I never took any classes in, in phonetics or phonology or any of that stuff. But I, I just sheepishly walked into the lab with some recordings, and I, and I asked him, I go, can I make some voice prints? Because they had, they had the voice print machine. The voice print machine is kind of like a modified old fax machine. It was the, the basis of how it worked. You would wrap a piece of, of thermal-sensitive paper. Uh, or, the, or Actually, it's not thermal-sensitive. It's this weird paper that uh, an electrical discharge would, would etch blackness into the white. And uh, it would spin around on a drum, and um, every rotation of the drum, the recording, it would, it would do two and a half seconds, would repeat every single rotation, and a tuned filter would scan down the paper and make a voice print. Of, uh, and um, I had no equipment like this and no way of, of you know, writing software that would do this on anything I owned. So I asked him, can I use the equipment? And he said, absolutely. And he heard the recordings of Sam and he was just enamored. And he goes, anything you want, anytime, you know, as much 
as much of this paper as you want, as much lab time as you want. You want to borrow books from, the, from our library, anything you want. And he was just an amazing guy. Um, you know, anything that would further speech research, you know, he just found it uh, fascinating. And, and when he looked at the voice prints of Sam, they don't look human at all. And he looked at it and he goes, it is just amazing that we can understand what this is saying. It just looked like, <laughs> it, you know, it looked like Lego. <laughs> Everything was very blocky and steppy, you know, not at all smooth, you know, in the transitions. Every, everything was stepped and you can really see it on a voice print. It it's, uh, doesn't look at all like human speech. So, um, yeah, he was, he was a really fantastic guy. And... Uh, and I, I don't think I could have done as good a job on it had he not given me access to the lab there. Oh, how nice. Wikipedia here says he died in 2006. Yes, yes. He, uh, in the latter part of his life, he traveled the world. <clears throat> he traveled the world collecting samples of dying languages to document them. Hmm. And wow. he, would go, he would go to all these far-off countries and and uh make recordings of these people and and uh i believe it's a database off the uh, ucla website somewhere sounds of the world's languages you can access it and you can uh, to this day and you can listen to all of these uh all these languages that are dying or dead and he was traveling and had some kind of heart issue or something in an airport and died shortly later it's a real shame. He was a very, very That's nice. Too bad. Yeah. Cool. If you could send a message to the people who use the Ataris and the Apple IIs and the Commodore 64s, uh -huh. and uh, and you can right now, what would you mm -hmm. tell them? You mean people that use it today? Sure. As oh, as nostalgia. Well, if you use well, Sam, put a period at the end. <laughs> That's what I would tell them. Um, well, I, I, I don't know. It's, um, I guess the interest in using old 8-bit computers, it, it depends if, you're, if, if you used to use them when you were younger and you're having like a hit of nostalgia, or if you're younger and you just want to see what, you know, what mommy and daddy used when they were, you know, when they were young, um, you know, I guess it's, they're coming at it from, from various angles. They, they are fun. Um, it's interesting to see how fast a word processor runs on them uh, versus how fast it runs on a machine that's millions of times faster. They run about the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, that speaks to uh, the necessity to code efficiently when your machine is, is not so powerful. And it teaches really good coding practices and programming practices, whereas nowadays you can write anything and the machine is so fast it will hide your your uh, lack of experience, shall, shall we say? So um, I would say try to try to program them, try to try to uh, you know get get them to do things, and I, I think it will improve your programming skills overall. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Right. Well, thank you. Here is in full network and cannot number twenty nine. It is the first track of Switch Dog Park. I went the car alone. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute you something, I encourage you to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a non-profit digital library with a mission of universal access to all knowledge. Make your text into simple contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thank you.